Thank you. Uh, my name is Jan Schafranek. I work for Red Hat, and uh, I am a tech lead of Six Storage in Kubernetes. Uh, there was supposed to be Shing together with me, uh, our co-chair, but unfortunately she got COVID. Uh, she's fine, just she's positive and she can't go here. And uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. I had like a beautiful presentation. We worked on long time for that, on that, but you won't see it. <laughs> So, uh, for some part, we can go with all the slides. Uh, the first thing, who is Six Storage? Six Storage is a special interest group. Uh, we look after storage in Kubernetes. Uh, we have almost. Hey! <laughs> Thank you. So, well, now I can show you the agenda. So I will briefly cover who we are. Uh, I will di dive deeper into CSI migration, which is one of the latest features we do. And then we, I will cover the past releases, the future releases, and how to get engaged. So who we are. Uh, officially, we have two co-chairs, Sad Ali from Google, Xing Yang from VMware, and uh, two tech leads, Michel O from Google and, Red, and me from Red Hat. But it's not only us, four people. Uh, we have many contributors from many companies. Uh, Shing did the numbers, and we have more than 4,000 people on our Slack channel, on the main channel. We have more than 1,000 people on Slack channel just for CSI. Uh, our bi-weekly meeting is attended roughly around uh, by, by 25 people. And uh, throughout the time, we got 32 uh, different approvers in our packages and GitHub repositories. So we are a pretty big group of people, but not everybody is active. Uh, somebody just appeared, asked a question on Slack, and it's then silent. Uh, so we are always looking for new contributors, new coders. You don't need to even to code. You can help with reviews. You can help with triaging bugs. You can fix our documentation, which deserves some work, and so on. So don't hesitate. Uh, just contribute, send pull request, ask on Slack. We are there for you. Uh, what we do actually is we maintain the storage APIs in Kubernetes. Means like persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, storage classes, and everything around that. So dynamic provisioning, volume attachment, mounting, uh, unmounting, detaching, deleting volumes, uh, and uh, related stuff like snapshots, uh, resizes, and that, that stuff. Uh, we maintain Kubernetes in three volume plugins. And we have a deal with uh, Signode that we will maintain part of the ephemeral volumes, like secrets, config maps, and that does the like real storage stuff, the mounting, and they do the other stuff like getting the config maps and getting the secrets from Kubernetes API server. We also maintain Kubernetes. Uh, sorry, we maintain. Yeah, we maintain Kubernetes implementation of CSI. We maintain all the sidecars, and quite surprisingly, we don't maintain too many C uh, CSI drivers. Most of the CSI drivers that Kubernetes ships uh, are owned by SQL provider. These are the cloud, uh, CSI drivers for the clouds. Uh, for example, Rook, uh, so, uh, Ceph has its own uh, CSI driver under Rook, and so on. So we maintain basically NFS and a couple of uh, similar CSI drivers, but. Yeah, that's what we do. Now I would like to dive deeper into CSI migration. Unfortunately, we started late, and I don't even have time. So we will barely scratch the surface. So what is CSI migration? Uh, as you probably know, we have some entry code in Kubernetes, GitHub repository for volume plugins. And at the same time, we have CSI drivers that do basically the same thing. So uh, we would like to uh, move the code from Kubernetes completely, wipe it out, and under the hood, silently route all the storage calls to the CSI drivers. So we don't need to maintain everything twice. Uh, the same idea got uh, sick cloud provider. They want to move the cloud providers from entry from Kubernetes, move it away. So the volume plugins must naturally follow. We are not migrating any data. The data state is all, st states where it is. Uh, although the, like the CSI migration term could 
resemble data migration, but not, we are not migrating anything anywhere. We are not even changing the API. So if you have entry volumes, entry PVs, entry storage classes, uh, and your stateful set deployments that use that, you don't need to change anything in theory. If we did our homework right, right, you just upgrade to a version that has CSA migration enabled, or you enable it manually while it's, while it's off by default, and you don't need to change anything. Everything should work. And, of course, the cloud-based volumes will go first, and the others will slowly follow. We are uh, moving Portworx and Ceph. Uh, right now, who knows who will move the other ones. So, brief introduction, how currently in three volume plugins handle all the storage uh, requests. So, on the left, there is a user that creates in three storage class and PVC. On the right, uh, there is a PV controller, persistent volume controller in the cube control manager that decides that is, uh, it needs to provision a new volume. So th this diagram shows dynamic provisioning. Uh, so the PV controller sees the claim, it sees the storage class, it sees its entry storage class, so it finds the volume plugin, calls it. This is a simple function call, nothing complicated. The volume plugin calls the cloud provider, the cloud provider uses some cloud the API and provisions the volume, right? So now, the same scenario with CSI migration enabled. It starts the same. The user have the, exactly the same storage class as before. No change there. It creates the same storage class. They create the PVC. PV controller wants to provision. PV controller doesn't have any entry volume plugins. They are gone. So what does it do? Uh, it translates the storage class, the entry storage class, to CSI storage class using CSI translation, li translation library. And since it has a CSI storage class now, it knows what to do uh, with CSI. It just marks the PVC for dynamic provisioning. And on the CSI driver side, uh, in the CSI driver pod, it uh, looks this way. There is external provisioner, which basically translates the uh, Kubernetes API objects into CSI cores, uh, into CSI gRPC cores. So the external provisioner, it sees, I have a PVC, I need to dynamically provision it. And it sees entry storage class because the translation in the Kube Control Manager, it happened just in memory. So the external provisioner sees the entry storage class, it uses the same library, translates it to CSI, and it handles it in the CSI way. And calls the driver, and driver, driver calls, the call, uh, calls the cloud. So all these translations, uh, they happen only in memory. We can't update storage classes, we can't update PVs in the API server. Uh, basically, these objects are mostly immutable. Most of you probably already heard that. Uh, and for good reason, like if we change the objects during, I don't know, attaching or during dynamic provisioning, like things could go very, very racy, very, very wrong. So they are immutable. So everybody who processes entry PVs, entry storage classes, now has the library. They can translate it to CSI and use it after that. And all the other components, like external attacher or attach detach controller, resizer, everything, everybody does this in memory translation. So why it's compli so complicated? Because the API is bad. Well, it's not bad, it's good, but it doesn't allow us, us to change the objects. And even if we could change the objects, and we would uh, change the storage class and PV, and you decide that you don't like, uh, the new version with CSI migration is broken, and you want to downgrade, you would downgrade to a version where you have the CSI objects, so you couldn't really downgrade. Uh, but in this case, uh, we keep the entry PVs, entry storage classes as they are, so you can upgrade, downgrade as you want. There is a link to cap and design. It's pretty complicated, like the picture I showed, it's just barely scratching the surface. Uh, we have a schedule. The schedule, you can see, we started in Kubernetes 14. That's three and a half years ago. Uh, we had the first alpha, but in Kubernetes 124, the first two are GA, OpenStack Cinder and Azure Disk. GA means it is, the CSI migration is on by default, uh, the entry volume plugins are not really used, and you cannot turn it off. So you must use the CSI drivers there. Uh, the other most of the other entry volume plugins based on cloud uh, will follow very shortly. Azure File, Amazon EBS, Google Persistent Disks will follow in 125, and vSphere probably in 126. All these uh, timelines is kind of 
work in progress and subject to change. Uh, we switched, we swapped the GA a couple of times already. Now it looks like we are really going for it. And CephRBD and Portworks, we just started moving the entry. Uh, maybe it will go beta in the next release, maybe not, we will see. And uh, also when we are uh, doing this CSI migration, we are sometimes deprecating features that were in tree and are not supported by the CSI drivers. For example, for vSphere, uh, if you want to test CSI migration, you need vSphere version 7.0.2, which is pretty recent one. So if you have anything based on 6.5, 6.7, it's time to upgrade it to 7. something. So if you want to test it, uh, if you use some managed Kubernetes in the cloud or use, you use some enterprise Kubernetes distro, uh, consult your Kubernetes vendor. They should tell you what to do. And also they will handle the migration during upgrade to GA, GA version. So you just follow their documentation. If you are on your own and you use vanilla Kubernetes, uh, you of course must install the CSA driver, uh, the replacement CSA driver. and. Uh, Either uh, you test it while the, while the CSI migration is still off by default, uh, then you need to just enable a couple of feature gates. Uh, nothing special here. Uh, there is only one catch. You need to update uh, to flip them in a certain order, like Kube Control Manager first, and then Kubelets. If you do it in wrong order, bad things will happen. Uh, and why are you flipping the gates on nodes? You should drain the node flip the gate and uncode on it. So, uh, so like the migrated and non-migrated volumes don't mix, are not mixed on one node. The whole node must be either migrated as a whole or, or non-migrated as a whole. Uh, for the features, uh, we, uh, in CSI migration, we support only the features that well, that were uh, supported before the migration. So if a volume plugin supported resize, uh, the same volume uh, migrated to CSI will support resize, but it will not get new features that CSI driver offers. So you will not get uh, snapshots, you will not get cloning. No, you must use the CSI uh, PVs right away. If you use entry, uh, that will not work. And I already told you about the deprecations. Uh, please re read the release notes very, very careful, carefully. And finally, uh, that was CSI migration. Now, brief uh, overview of what we did in Kubernetes 123. Uh, if you had any issues with FS group uh, being applied too slowly because we apply it recursively on every file on the volume, there is a way how to skip it. So it applies only once when pod first starts, but all the other pods will skip it. Uh, this is now GA. Uh, we also allow CSI drivers to opt, opt out from, CS, uh, from FS group at all. So if a CSI driver provides a volume that doesn't have like POS6 or that can't support FS group, for example, an FS share with uh, root squash, uh, the CSI drivers have option how to tell it to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will not try to ap apply FS group. And finally, generic ephemeral volumes are GA, which is like uh, empty there on steroids, much better version of empty there. As beta, uh, we allow CSI drivers to apply FS group by themselves, but this, it is only for CSI drivers that uh, have like mount option or something similar to apply FS group. Uh, the, all the other CSI drivers should uh, depend on <coughs> Kubernetes uh, to apply the FS group. And we are on moving with CSI migration in 124. And as alpha, uh, users can now cancel volume resize uh, if it failed on the storage backend. So, well, you know, the Kubernetes, it always retries, retries, retries. Uh, but this storage backend always says no, no, no. So you can now cancel the resize. Uh, uh, we are honoring reclaim policy in PVs in better way than we did, uh, because if you delete PV objects manually, uh, 
Sometimes the reclaim policy was not honored, and uh, we left orphan volumes in the storage backend. Now it's going to be better. Uh, we will always honor the reclaim policy, even if you remove, if you delete the PV manually. Uh, we are working with sick apps uh, to remove PVCs automatically from sick sets. And again, we are moving CSA migration. And what's the time? Awesome. So, and for the rest, I should. Yeah, well, I closed it. Damn. Uh, I had a res. Oops, sorry. I have a recording from Shink, and I hope it's going to work. The audio is going to work. Can you pass the audio from? Yeah, Polling extension was introduced as an alpha feature in Kubernetes 1.8, and it went beta in 1.11, and with Kubernetes 1.24, it is finally GA. This is a big milestone. This feature allows users to edit their PVC objects and specify new size in PVC spec, and Kubernetes will automatically expand the volume on the underlying storage backend and also expand the file system in use by the pod. This can happen either online or offline, depending on CSI driver's support. Hamant has done lots of work to bring this feature to GA. There's also this uh, recovering from resize failure feature mentioned earlier that is also aimed to make this feature more robust. The second feature I want to highlight is CSI storage capacity tracking. CSI storage capacity tracking was introduced in 1.19, beta in 1.21, and now it is GA in 1.24. Storage capacity tracking adds an API for CSI driver to report storage capacity and uses that information in the Kubernetes scheduler when choosing a node for a pod. This feature is especially important for local volumes well, capacity is bound to each node. Thanks, Patrick, for driving this feature to GA. We also have a beta feature, Volume Populator, in 1.24. This is an important feature for the backup and restore use case. The Volume Populator feature allows us to provision a PVC for an external data source, such as a backup repository not just for another PVC or for a volume snapshot. In addition, it allows us to dynamically provision a PVC, having volume populated from that backup repository, and honor the wait for first consumer volume binding mode during restore to ensure that volume is placed at the right node while pod is scheduled. When there's a request to create a PVC, with the data source, the volume populator controller makes sure PV is created and populated with data from the data source and binds with the PVC. To use this feature, the any volume data source feature gate needs to be enabled. It is beta in 24, so the feature gate is enabled by default now. We also worked on a few other features in 1.24. Volume House monitoring feature allows CSI driver to communicate back to Kubernetes regarding volume's condition after it is provisioned and used by a pod so that Kubernetes can report an event on a PVC or a pod if the volume becomes unhealthy. It has controller and agent side logic. This feature was originally introduced in 1.19. In 1.21, the agent side logic was moved to Kubelet. In 1.24, we did an update and added volume health into metrics on the Kubelet side. In 1.24, we also introduced a new alpha feature, non-graceful no shutdown. This feature allows stateful workloads to fill over to a different node after the original node is shut down or in a non-recoverable state, such as hardware failure or broken OS. You might have heard about the graceful no shutdown feature and wonder what is the difference between these two. The graceful node shutdown can be graceful only if the no shutdown action 
can be detected by a cubelet ahead of the F2 shutdown. However, there are cases where a no shutdown action may not be detected by cubelet. This could happen either because the shutdown command does not trigger the systemd inhibitor locks mechanism that cubelet relies on, or because of a configuration error. To use the non graceful no shutdown feature, you must enable the node out of service volume detach feature gate for cube controller manager. Manually set the out of service tint on the shutdown node. The parts on the shutdown node will be detected, will be deleted. Persistent volumes attached to the shutdown node will be detached. And for stable sets, new parts will be created successfully on a different running node. And next, I want to talk about this new alpha feature, control volume mode conversion. Without this feature, it is possible to create a PVC from a volume snapshot with a volume mode that is different from the original volume mode. This could lead to a potential security issue if there is a CVE in the kernel. On the other hand, converting the volume mode from a file system to block when creating a PVC from a volume snapshot is being used by backup vendors for more efficient backups. So we introduced this alpha feature that allows Kubernetes to check whether the user has the permission to convert the volume mode. If not, reject the request. This way, we can support this value use case only for authorized users. There are also some deprecations and removals in 1.24. Volume snapshot v1 v1 beta 1 API is removed in 1.24. Please update to volume snapshot v1 API as soon as possible. CSI storage capacity v1 beta 1 API is deprecated in 1.24 and it will be removed in a future release. This field version less than 7.2 v2 is deprecated in 1.24. This is related to the CSI migration feature. We recommend users to upgrade to 7.0 U2 and higher as soon as possible. 1.24 was just released, and we just started with 1.25 planning. I will quickly go over what we're working on in 1.25. There are a few features targeting GA in 1.25. The first one is CSI FMO volume. For this feature, we set volume type to CSI in the pod inline definition and specify the driver name and volume attributes. For a CSI driver to support CSI FMR volumes, it must be modified or implemented specifically for this purpose. A CSI driver is suitable for CSI FMR inline volumes if it serves a special purpose and meets custom per volume parameters, like drivers that provide secrets to a pod Secret store CSI driver is a good example. A CSI driver is not suitable for CSI FMR inline volumes when provisioning is not local to the node or when FMR volume creation requires volume attributes that should be restricted to an administrator, for example, parameters in a storage class. We are also planning to move local FMR storage capacity isolation feature to GA in 1.25. This feature provides storage usage isolation for shared partitions. There is also delegate FS group to CSI driver instead of kubelet feature that we are targeting GA in 1.25. Uh, we are also targeting a few features to beta in 1.25. This includes CSI volume health, recovering from resize failures, and uh, non graceful no shutdown. In 1.25, we are also working on a few alpha features. COSI is a project we have been working on for several releases now. COSI proposes object storage Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. It also introduces gRPC interfaces for object storage providers to write drivers to provision buckets. COSI components include a COSI controller manager that binds COSI created buckets to bucket claims. 
This is similar to how the PV controller binds PVs to PVCs. Cozy Components includes a Cozy sidecar that watches Cozy Kubernetes API objects and calls Cozy Driver. Cozy Components also includes a Cozy Driver that implements gRPC interfaces to provision buckets. We also have uh, the secure Linux relabeling re with mount options that tries to speed up container startup time and avoid changing each file on the volumes recursively. And, uh, and there's also volume snapshot namespace transfer and provisioning volumes for cross namespace snapshot PVC. Those features are also targeting alpha in 1.25 release. We also have a few features that are in design or being prototyped. We also have a cross seek uh, working group and projects that are listed here. I want to mention change block tracking or CBT. This is a feature that the data protection working group is actively working on. This feature identifies blocks of data that have changed. It enables incremental backups to identify changes from the last previous backups, writing only change blocks. Without CBT, backup vendors have to do full backups all the time. This is not space efficient, takes longer time to finish, and needs more bandwidth. So we have done a POC of a CBT, and design is in progress. We are trying to target alpha in 1.25. There's also runtime assisted mounting of persistent volumes. That is a project we co-owned with uh, Signode. We also try to bring it to Alpha in 1.25. Uh, another feature is uh, in-use protection or links. We co-own that feature with uh, API machinery. This feature proposes a generic way to protect objects from deletion while it is in use. We are targeting alpha in 1.25 release. So uh, those are all the features that we want to talk about today. Now uh, let's talk about how to get involved. Here is a community page that shows a lot of information on how to get started in Six Storage. We have bi-weekly meetings that happens every second Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. In that meeting, we will uh, go over the features that we are working on for every release. And we will discuss about designs, uh, talk about some PRs that need attention. So um, join that meeting and you can learn what we are doing there. If there's anything you're interested in, you can uh, maybe pick it up and uh, help contributing. We also have a mailing list that is shown here. So join that mailing list, you will get invites to our meetings. There are also Slack channel. You can also uh, ask questions on the Slack channels. So that's all we have today. Thank you all for attending. Bye-bye. So, thanks, Ching. Uh, I just noticed there is one thing I forget about 123. We are deprecating flex volumes. If you are using flex volumes, stop. <laughs> please move to CSI. So but that's basically what I wanted to cover here. Uh, at the end, there are a couple of links for the newbies, like uh, the landing page of storage, some uh, concept uh, for P about PVs, PVCs, and this kind of stuff. So if you are new, uh, this is a great place to start. And I am now open for any questions. I'm not sure how much, how much time we have. We can, he said we can go five minutes over, which is very nice of them. Um, remember, wait for the microphone so that your question gets recorded for the recording. And who would like to start? And thank you, Jing. I think Jing is watching. Um, and there were no <laughs> online questions at the moment, but if there are, I will yeah. flag you. Questions, come on. I know this is a very talkative group. I've known you all well for years, especially the front row over here. OK, here we go. Hang on. Uh, so I was wondering about non-graceful shutdown of the node. Based on what information KCM is able to detect whether the node is shut down or not? Uh, right now, uh, it is very manual process. Somebody must uh, add special taint to a node that the node is really shut down, 
and also the president must make sure that the notice really shut down and will not come back in any foreseeable future, and we will start evicting stuff. Uh, of course, uh, people are thinking about some automation based on cloud API, because based on IPMI or whatever. Uh, this will come in the future, I believe. Perfect. Hello, you hear me? Uh, we are using a very old uh, provider, which is the Fiber Channel, which doesn't have any CSI provider. Uh, what will happen with uh, this kind of volumes? Uh, so, uh, if we want to migrate an uh, entry volume to CSI, uh, we must have replacing uh, CSI driver. We don't have one. We, hold, we don't have a good one for CSI for ISCSI. We don't have a good one for Fiber Channel. So we are not migrating them. They will stay in tree until there is good replacement. At the same time, uh, I know that the, all the storage, well, not all, but most of the storage vendors uh, have their own CSI drivers for ISCSI, NFS, uh, uh, and Fiber Channel. So uh, you should start using the vendor driver if you can and uh, leave the entry pvs for fiber channel for ice because just leave, it, leave them there we are not removing the support until we have the replacement csi driver does it answer your question yeah. don't worry <laughs> other questions okay hang on Hi. Uh, are there any plans for supporting like, like the, the, the real production one, the host path CSI driver? Uh, host path CSI driver? Yeah. For host path CSI driver is a test tool. <laughs> it's not anything like production ready. Yeah, I know. I, I wonder if there is any plan or... Uh, uh, what's the use case, I would ask? So we are using the local disks for our database. And uh, we would like, for example, to set, set up some quotas. Uh, on the local disk, right? So, uh, why can't you use the local static volumes, like local volumes API instead of CSI or Topo LVM or something like that? Uh, so, so, the Topo LVM, uh, it is something that brings you another layer, and we are worried about performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and we require also a, an XFS partition for our use case. Mm -hmm. So, something like um, a production ready host path would be really great. Mm. Okay. Like, again, it's a, it's a test tool. We stuff like weird stuff that we need to test. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> we use it for testing of CSI features. So we, there are some hooks and this kind of stuff. If you don't want that in production. But at the local volumes, like, it was just local volumes. They should just work. But there is no dynamic provisioner for them. Well, so hold on, hold on. So either you want dynamic provisioning or and LVM or something that does dynamic provisioning or you want to disk, like raw disks. Like you can't dynamically provision raw disks. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> like like you need somebody like who brings the disk and connects it to the machine, right? <laughs> you can call it dynamic provisioner, but... <laughs> 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 so... Um, but well, if you create directories dynamically on some partition that on some partition that is attached to your uh, volume, and you are able to set quotas on them, this yeah. is something like it, it is dynamic provisioning. Yeah, it is. But yeah, I guess this is a special use case. Like, um, gather some community, write a CSI driver. I did. I wonder whether <laughs> I, I'm duplicating the host path. So yeah, we, we don't have such plans with okay. host path really. Sorry. Thanks. I like his idea, though. It's a community. Gather the community and build it, right? All right, here we go. Probably have time for like two more questions. No, I think I because we we are we've just built a, we just released an open source operator for databases, and actually I think that's a use case that we, especially on bare metal, you can you you might want to explore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, two years ago at in San Diego, I was actually talking, uh, asking about, I mean, the same questions to Rook people. They took me for crazy, you know, at that time. I remember that. But <laughs> I think yeah, we can talk, maybe. 
Yeah, but I think, uh, I mean, creating logic, I mean, um, uh, physical volumes and logical volumes on the fly, also with separate permissions, we, I think that's, that's something that I think could have a use case. Maybe it's niche, but for yeah. high-end... Uh, like feel free uh, to case. yeah yeah okay well, contribute it. Like yeah we already contribute to the database so I think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think if we can get some help on the storage that would be good. Thank you. All right, I think that's probably all the time we have, but Jan can probably stick around for a few minutes if you have any yeah, extra questions sure. for him. But I just want to say thank you, Jing. We hope you feel better soon. Thank you, Jan. Can we give him a hand? Big round of applause. Thank you.